Okay, so we're going to talk uh, today about part of the lives of the stars, right? As you all know, we could spend an entire year on any topic we decide to talk about in here. Uh, for the stars in particular, um, there's kind of three talks that I usually give. The one that I'm going to tell you today is tied to the one that we're going to do next week, which is how do stars form and what do we know about stars in the young parts of their lives. Um, there's another part, which is kind of the boring part, but there's a lot of physics in it, which is what do stars do in their midlife? And you know, all of us know midlife is not as exciting as when we're young and so you know so sometimes we tell that story and we don't and then the other part is about stellar death and we've we've had the stellar death story a little bit before um, we talked about it a little bit a couple weeks ago when we talked about black holes um, and things like that but um, but today I'm going to focus on this kind of early part of a star's life and we'll do that part um, next week as well because it's tied to uh, the early part of a star's life is tied to the formation of planets which is what we're going to talk about next week so um, before I start, the, one of my most favorite things here at the Adler is right outside here uh, in the hallway. It's got the big pictures of the diameters of all the stars, and it shows their different sizes, and it tells you their temperatures and uh, their brightnesses and everything. And that, the story of that wall is the big, is, um, begins in the story that we're going to tell here today. And so understanding the lives of the stars and the way they evolve and, and why their properties are the way they are explains a lot about that wall. Um, and so um, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but um, uh, we'll come back to and talk about that wall eventually. Um, so today what we'll do is we'll start talking about the things that we can see or the things that we know or that we've been taught, namely that the stars are hot and bright and why they have the properties they do based on the being hot and bright. Um, we'll, in the middle somewhere, get to the stuff that we always like, which is the eye candy, staring at all the pretty pictures and understanding why the pretty pictures are all about the physics that we've been talking about. Um, and then at the end, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about these things that you see in this picture here, which are open star clusters. And open star clusters are part of the beginning of the story of stellar evolution and the beginning of stars' lives. So, so um, the thing that I think today what this ends up being more than anything else is a focus on young stars and their lives and how they're born and where they um, uh, come from and what we see that convinces us that we understand the beginning of a star's life. Okay? Okay, so as always, uh, the, the slides will be up here uh, on the website, and uh, I'll get the audio with the slides up as well. So those of you who are, uh, who are listening again, or if you have friends who aren't able to make it and listening, um, those will be up by the weekend, and then you can, you can take a look at these. Okay? The stars are always the most interesting thing when you go out at night, because they're the most numerous thing you see when you look at the night sky. Right? So does anyone recognize this part of the sky? What part of the sky is this? How about if I help you? You see those three stars in the row there? Orion. Yeah, there's Orion, okay? So there's the shoulders, there's the belt, this is the so-called sword, and here's his knees, right? And these are all stars, and I like this part of the sky because when you look at the stars, you can see very distinctly, even with your eye when you look at Orion, that all these stars are a little bit different. Okay, and that's important because the fact that the stars are different tells us something about their past lives, where they were born, how they've lived their lives, and what their ultimate futures will be. And so we'll spend a little bit of time talking uh, today about stars in different regions of this part of the constellation. I'll also point out, we're not going to mention it today, but right there, that is the star Sirius. So when you are looking at the belt of Orion, if you take the belt and you just follow it diagonally and down to your left, the first bright star you encounter is Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky. Okay, so um, the other thing I'll point out here, and we'll come back to this in the middle, is right here in the sword, this star in the middle of the sword is not a star at all. What is that? It's the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula. And uh, to your eye, it will look very star-like, but if you put even just a pair of binoculars on it, you dig in your kid's toy box and get those binoculars that came with their Batman utility belt, it should show that that's a, uh, that that's a nebula, not a star. Okay, and we'll come back to that and we'll talk about it a little bit today. So the stars are the most numerous des uh, denizens of the sky. And so the question is, what do we know about them? And how do we know all the things that I'm about to tell you today? As far as I know, none of us have been to any star. Anyone here been to any other star? Okay. As far as I know, none of us have ever even been to the closest star to us, which is the sun. We haven't even been to the sun. It's the closest star to Earth, and we've never been to it. But we know this big, long story that I'm about to tell you about the stars and their lives. Every single thing we've learned about the stars, we've learned from afar. It's not like Mars. 
It's not like Jupiter. It's not like Venus where we've actually gone and landed or attempted to land or flown into the planet. The stars we've never been to. And so everything that we're talking about today, we've learned only by looking. Okay? So let's talk about that. So the kinds of questions we would like to know, right? You, first of all, how many are there? Does anyone know how many stars you can see with your naked eye? Six to 9,000, depending on how good your eyes are. Okay, how many are in the Milky Way? Too many, Too many to count. About 400 billion is the rough number we usually carry around. How many galaxies are there? Same. Yeah, so the numbers used to be about 100 billion, but now you see numbers as high as 600 billion. Okay, so you multiply 600 billion by 400 billion, you get the total number of stars in the universe. And Gloria's holding her head because that's a really big number, right? There's a lot of stars. But we can ask questions about all of those stars. So how many is the first question, okay? Um, we want to know what do the colors of the stars mean? When you look at any picture of the sky, and I'll show you some more, we've seen several already, the stars have definite color. And even to your eye, when you go out in your backyard, some of the stars have color. What's the color mean? Okay. What are they made of? Um, why do they shine? How are, how, do, how are they born? Okay. How long do they live? How do they die? Right? All of these questions are all about the stars. So let's talk about how we know that. So I'll show you a set of pictures here. Does anyone know anyone in this set of pictures? Okay. I know a couple of them, but the point is, none of you know any of them. So if I asked you to do the following, could you arrange all of these pictures from youngest to oldest? Could you do it? Yeah, everyone's nodding. Yeah, I think you could. So if I do this, I think the order goes something like this. Does anyone disagree with that order? OK. So how do you know this is the right order? You just told me you don't know any of these people. And as far as I know, none of you have seen any of these people before 40 seconds ago. So how do you know this is the right order to put them in? By their looks. OK, by their looks, by their characteristics. OK, so let's talk about them. OK, okay this is Violet. Aw, isn't she cool? OK, how do you know Violet goes right there at the very beginning? Because I've never seen Dario wearing a little bonnet. Right? Don't you think? <laughs> Why do I? Yeah, maybe I haven't lived. Why do I know Violet goes over here? <laughs> she's small, okay? She's an infant. How do you know she's an infant? She has chubby little cheeks, right? What else? She has no, this, he has no teeth. <laughs> okay, right. So he has other characteristics, right? So no teeth is certainly one of the reasons I decided she went up here, but it's not the only reason because he had no teeth and I stuck him over here. Okay? Okay? So if I look at any of these people, they all have certain characteristics. No two of them are the same, but there are characteristics that we observe, that we see, that we identify with a particular stage in their lives. Okay, This guy, you can't even see his face. How do you know he goes right there? Because he's kind of balding, right? He's clearly got a job he hates, right? He's holding his head. <laughs> that doesn't happen to these kids, right? <laughs> this guy's retired. This guy hates his job. Okay, so you know, not like us, we love our jobs, right? Okay, but, but you know what these characteristics are. And the reason you know what they are is because in your life, you have encountered thousands and thousands of people, all of whom have some of the characteristics on this picture, or in this set of pictures. And when you look at those characteristics, you've decided no teeth means you're either really old or really young. And if you're really short, it probably means you're really young. If you have white hair, it probably means you're really old. Okay? If you're starting to bald or your hair's starting to go gray, it means you're somewhere in the middle. Okay? And all of those characteristics are the characteristics that you use to identify what we mean by age. And so the same thing applies to the stars. We just said there were 400 billion times 600 billion stars in the universe. 
So if I look at enough of them and I can look at their characteristics and decide whether those characteristics mean they're old and whether those characteristics mean they're middle-aged and whether those characteristics mean they're young, I can do this exact same game with the stars. Okay, Gloria. Now in the second row, the second picture, the gentleman may be losing some hair, but you'll see his hands do not show any signs. Of right, right. So maybe, maybe these two need to be swapped, or maybe these two need to be swapped, right? I'm already getting a little gray here, right? Maybe I'm older than I look, or maybe I'm younger than I look, and I'm just going gray early, okay? So it's not precise, because you don't know anything about these people. You're just going on gross characteristics. And the same thing will be true of the stars. I'm going to look at a star, and I'm going to say, hmm, maybe this star is older than this star, but I definitely know that both of these stars are older than this one over here and younger than this one over here. But you'll never get it right unless you ask the star for its birthday and get its social security card and all that good stuff, right? Okay, but that's a perfectly good observation. That's exactly the kind of tr trouble that we face when we talk about doing the classification that I'm talking about right now. Okay, other questions? Okay, and so we can play this exact same game with the stars, right? We have figured out the story of the stars by looking at lots and lots and lots and lots of stars in the sky. There's only 9,000 you can see with your naked eye. But through a telescope, there's millions. Okay, so this is a picture of an area of the sky called the Ro-Ophiuchi complex. Okay, so this is down uh, in the constellation between uh, Ophiuchus and uh, Scorpius. Okay, so this bright red star right here is the star Antares, which is the heart of the scorpion. So this is the head of Scorpius here. I don't know if you draw it as his head or his pinchers. And the body of the Scorpius goes down like this. Okay, Ophiuchus is over here. Uh, this bright cluster right here, this is the star cluster M4. Remember we talked about globular clusters uh, a couple weeks ago. So this is a globular cluster. Uh, that you can see in binoculars. It's very bright. So, so when you go looking for it, you're like, how do I find it? And you just look at Antares and it's right there. It's right next to Antares. Okay? But you'll notice this region of the sky, there's lots of stuff going on. There's lots of color. There's lots of stuff that's clearly not stars. There's a lot of different colors of stars. There's a lot of bright stars and a lot of faint stars. Okay? If you just take a region like this in the sky and you look at all the stars and you try and sort them, It'll be just like the game that we just played. Based on seeing millions and millions of stars, you can start putting them into piles that say, some are like this, and some are like this, and some are like this. And the whole game in stellar astronomy is figuring out then which order to put the piles in. Okay? Is everyone okay with that? Okay, so we could look at the environment. Right? Every one of these stars, some of them are embedded in the gas, some of them are in front of the gas, some are them behind the gas. Something about where they're living may tell us something we need to know. We can look at the light. We'll do a lot of that today. We talked about that before. The light encodes information, fingerprints of the star, what the stars are made of. We could look at the brightness of the stars. We could look at the color of the stars. All of these things are the things that we have at our disposal. And despite the fact that none of us have been to a star, and I'm pretty sure none of us are going to go to a star in our lifetimes, this information is enough to work out the whole big mystery of what the stars' lives are like. Candle flames. Which one of these flames, if you look at them, is hottest? The one on the right. And how do you know that? The color. Because when you were little and you were trying to, you know, heat up paper clips or burn your marshmallows, right? Your mom was always stick it in the blue part of the flame. Because the blue part of the flame is the hottest part of the flame. Okay? Now, when you think about color, when how many of you have taken art classes? How many of you are artists? Any of you? Okay. What colors are hot and what colors are cool? Blues are cool. Blues are cool. Reds are warm, which is complete opposite of physics. Okay? So this is one of the difficulties that we have when we look at the universe. Anytime we look at the universe, whether it's in astronomy or chemistry or biology or physics or anything, is that we go into the whole game, the observation game, with preconceived notions, preconceived language, preconceptions about what certain things mean. And all of us were taught in elementary school that red is warm and blue is cool. But that's the exact opposite thing in physics. 
And so a lot of the times when you think about the world, you have to kind of train your brain to think what's actually going on. Okay, And in this case, we uh, know that color is an indicator of temperature. And the color that's an indicator of temperature here, namely that oranges, yellows, reds are cooler than blues, violets, is going to carry over to the stars. We showed you these spectra last time. Okay, So one of the things astronomers very early on started doing was they would take the light from the stars and they dump it through a prism and they noticed all the lines that we talked about last time. These are the Fraunhofer lines. Okay, So this is the sun on this side and this is Arcturus on this side. And the thing that we talked about before was that if you look at the lines between two different stars, they look similar in some ways and different in other ways. And so astronomers started categorizing stars into what we call spectral types. Okay, and they gave each spectral type a letter, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, okay, on down the line. Uh, I don't even know what the highest letter is, but at least goes through M. Okay? And the spectral type was a categorization made based on how strong the hydrogen lines in the spectrum were. Okay, so when you look at a spectrum like the Sun or Arcturus, they clearly have different spectral lines, but some of the lines are the same. So let's look at this yellow line right across here. Okay, so here's a line in Arcturus that's really strong and black. Okay, but when I go over here to the Sun, that line's still there, but it's a little bit weaker. Okay, so that's the kind of thing when we say how strongly a spectral feature shows up in the spectrum, that's what we're talking about. How strong is that line appear when I break it into a spectrum? There's clearly other things going on. If I follow that same line over here, you see this big black band here in Arcturus? There's almost nothing at that point in the sun spectrum. Okay, so they're clearly different. And again, this is an indicator of the difference in terms of what they called their spectral type. Okay, so early on, this is in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they were doing this all the time, and they were classifying every star they could take a spectrum of and just dumping them into these big buckets labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. Okay, and no one knew what the spectral classification meant. All we knew was that it was there. Okay, so this is how all science begins, right? The simplest thing you can do is look. And the simplest thing you can do when you look is break things up into categories, what we call taxonomy. So this was just taxonomy of spectral types. But this is how science works, right? You just gather as much information as you can, and you sort it out, and you let it sit there until someone clever comes along and figures out what it means. And eventually, someone clever did come along and figure out what this meant. And that person was Annie Jump Cannon. So uh, Cannon was uh, uh, a physics major. She got her degree from uh, Wellesley College in 1884. And as I'm sure most of you know, in those days, uh, women didn't engage in professional astronomy hardly at all. And she took about 10 years off after she got her physics degree. And then in 1896, Cannon went to Harvard College Observatory where she became one of the Harvard computers, who we've mentioned before. And she was put in charge of looking at these gigantic piles of spectral classes of stars. And what Cannon realized, what no one else had realized, was that the order A, B, C, D, F, G was convenient for when you were classifying stars, but it had absolutely nothing to do with physics. But she had a degree in physics. And what she figured out was that those letters the spectral classification correlated almost exactly with the temperature of the stars. And so this was the key. You didn't have to actually go measure the temperature. We've never been to a star. I can't take a thermometer and stick it in the surface of the star and measure the temperature. But the color, the spectral class, tells me right away what the temperature, the surface temperature of a star actually is. Okay? She was a phenomenal uh, spectral classifier. Over the course of her career, she classified 350,000 stars by eye. She looked at those spectras, like the one you and I just said, and said, this is a class A star, this is a class K star, this is a class M star. Okay, 350,000 of them. As far as I know, no one's ever classified more than, than Cannon did. So she was a, a phenomenal, phenomenal spectroscopist, uh, the, arguably the best the world has ever known. Okay, so, so this is really the key to stellar astrophysics. Figuring out that the spectral type of the stars is related to temperature is half the battle in figuring out what makes stars tick. And Cannon was the one who figured it out.
she rearranged these spectral types by temperature and she got this order. Okay, so this is a very famous order, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Okay, there's a famous mnemonic that goes with this. Does anyone know it? What is it? O, B, a fine girl or guy, kiss me. Okay, so of course we live in the modern age and one of the exercises for all my astronomy classes is always to come up with new versions of these. So I collect them. So if you have a clever one you'd like to, to send me, I will add it to the collection. So, uh, oh boy, another fearsome, greedy Klingon marauder. Um, oil, butter, and fat gonna kill me. Um, uh, only bodacious astronomers find gorilla killing meteors. Uh, can I think, can I remember any others? There's a whole bunch of, I have a whole bunch. Oscar bought a fancy garbage can Monday. Um, anyways, O-type stars have 50,000 degree surface temperatures. Okay, G-type stars have 6,000 degree surface temperatures. M-type stars have 3,500 degree surface temperatures. So color, we said, is an indicator of temperature. Okay, so what color was cool? And what color was hot? Okay, so look at these spectra, right? This spectrum, a cool star, has almost no blue in it, but it has a lot of red in it. Whereas this star, which is really, really hot, has far not too much red at all. I can see a little bit from where I'm standing, but it has a lot of blue in it. Okay, so as you go down this list of stars, the brightest color in the spectrum is roughly the brightest color that a star of that type or that temperature gives off. Okay, so the sun is type G. Okay, so what's the brightest color here in this spectrum? Well, it's red, but the peak is actually right here if I follow this diagonal line, okay? So if you actually plot the strengths, the strongest color in the sun's light is roughly yellow-green, about the color of safety vests that construction workers work. The reason, I call it fire engine green because the town I grew up in had a fire engine that color. No one apparently has fire engines that color anymore. Uh, but the reason those vests are that color is because your eye is exceedingly sensitive to that color because your eye has grown up staring at the world in the light of a star, which puts out more light in that color than any of the other light in the spectrum. Okay? So, okay, so color's an indicator of temperature. So let's go back to Orion and let's use this, okay? So here's Orion. Okay, so here's the belt stars, the shoulders, the knees, and the sword. Okay, what's the name of that star up there? That's Betelgeuse, right? Okay, so what color is it? Yellowish, orangish, reddish, okay? And if you actually go out and you look, it will look orangish, reddish, yellowish to your eye, okay? So if I look at the spectrum of Betelgeuse, it's class M, which is a very cool surface, okay? And strongly red in color, which is what your eye sees when you look at it, okay? What's the name of this star down here? Okay, that's Rigel, okay? What color is it? blue, and when you look at Orion, it's really bright, really intensely blue-white is the color I usually call it. Okay, if you look at the spectrum of Rigel, it's class B, okay, which is 20,000 degrees on the surface, and its spectrum is shifted over here towards the blue. Okay? Okay, now, Cannon made a huge step. She figured out that temperature and spectral class were connected. Why? Okay, so no one knew, right? We've never been to a star. We don't have some of this stuff in a beaker that I can take in the laboratory and use, okay? But we know it's true. We've made some observation about the universe, and now the job is to figure out why. And the person who figured that out was Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. In 1925, she was the first PhD in astronomy from uh, Radcliffe College, which was the women's college at Harvard. And she's the one who figured out what atomic spectra had to do with the temperature of the star. She's the one who figured out why the temperature was correlated with that particular order in the spectral classification. She worked out when you had a certain temperature and you put atoms together at that temperature, how the spectral lines looked, why they had the, the strength they did and which ones appeared and which ones didn't appear. And as a consequence of that, she could work out how much of a particular substance was in the star. And so she was the first person to realize 
that the sun was made of hydrogen with some helium, but mostly hydrogen. At that time, the prevailing belief was that the stars were made of the same stuff as the Earth. What's the Earth made of? Iron. Rock, right? What we call silicates, right? The planets are silicates. They got lots of silicon in them, okay? But she figured out that the sun was mostly hydrogen because she could explain why the spectrum looked the way it did. And it had to do with how much hydrogen there was and what the temperature of the sun was at the same time. Okay? Now, um, this was against the prevailing belief. And there was a very prominent astronomer of the day, Henry Norris Russell, who we'll talk about, about in a moment. And he strongly encouraged Kaposchkin not to publish that result because it clearly wasn't true. No one would believe it. And four years later, he derived the same result, published it. Um, he, to his credit, credited uh, Gaposchkin uh, for the result, but later just kind of started talking about it as his discovery. And so you will often see Russell credited with this realization. But it was Payne Gaposchkin that made the discovery. Okay? So. Otto Struve, who was one of the most eminent astronomers of the day, he, you know, one of these people who published 900 papers in his, in his career, right? He was just a phenomenal uh, observer. He said of her thesis, it was undoubtedly the most brilliant PhD thesis ever written in astronomy. Okay, it was a brilliant tour de force. And uh, we know what we know about the stars because she paved the way for us to understand it. Okay, so uh, she went on. She had a spectacular career in astronomy, as you might imagine. Uh, but she's the reason we know what we know. So you can look at a picture like this, right? And so now we know that if I take the spectrum of any of these stars, I know what the stars are made of. I can measure their temperatures. And now I can start thinking about other things that I can measure. And in particular, when I look at a picture like this, I can measure the brightness of the stars in the picture. Okay, so let's pick a couple of stars. So this star and this star are roughly the same color. Okay, which one's brighter? Yeah, the one on the left, okay? And this star and this star are roughly the same color, and which one's brighter? Yeah, the one on the bottom, okay? So the question is, how can two stars have the same color, that is to say they have the same temperature, but one's brighter than the other? Okay. So that's the obvious thing, OK? Now, what I didn't tell you, although I kind of told you up here in the corner, this is a picture of an object called NGC 290, which means all of these stars are together in a cluster. That's the name of the cluster, NGC 290. So if they're all together in a cluster, that means they're exactly the same distance from Earth as far as we're concerned. OK? So now we have to throw that idea out the window. So what other reason can we imagine? Size. Size, right? So this is what leads us to the idea that size is connected to this. OK, so let's talk about this. OK, so temperature basically tells you how much something's glowing. If I have a little cube of star here in my hand, OK, if it's cooler, it will glow a certain temperature. But if it's hotter, it will glow much brighter. And every little piece of the star has exactly the same temperature. So every little piece of the star that I could hold in my hand would glow with roughly the same brightness. OK, OK. so. Here's a star, okay? And if we turned out all the lights, which we won't do, but if I did, you would all be sitting here in the dark, basking in the glow of this tiny, tiny star, okay? But it's white. I should have colored it probably to make it a certain temperature, okay? But it has some temperature. But if I had another star that was exactly the same temperature but bigger, it would cast much more light on you. It illuminates much more. And I saw all of you light up when I put that star up on the screen, okay? so. Brighter stars can be bigger stars. Just like color gives me a way of measuring temperature, if I can do away with the distance difficulty, and sometimes we can and sometimes we can't, but if I know how far away a star is, then the brightness of the star is a measure of its size. Right? So we're confined here to the surface of the Earth, but already, we're developing the tools, the framework that we need to be able to tell you what the physical properties of the star are. Right? Properties that if it was me or you, I'd hold a tape measure up against you and throw you down on a scale, 
and I'd you know, take pictures of you and measure your brightnesses and all those things. Okay? But with the stars, all I can do is sit far away and look. But we can figure out how it all works. And these are, these are all examples. Okay, so the game then is looking for patterns. You can collect all the data in the world you want. Okay? But science is a big mystery story. And we're all protégés of Miss Marple. And we're taking all of that data and trying to piece the clues together to figure out what's the bigger story that we're being told. And when astronomers have piles and piles of data and we try and figure things out, trying to look for patterns, we make graphs. Right? How many of you remember making graphs in school? Okay, how many of you still make graphs every day? Some of you are Excel junkies, right, and have to write reports. Yeah, I see Natalie nodding her head out there. Okay, so we make graphs, and so we pick properties, we pick pieces of the data, and we plot them together to see if they make pretty pictures. Okay, and so I might decide I want to know if temperature and distance is correlated. Are stars that are close to the Earth always hotter or always cooler than stars that are farther away? So I pick a group of stars and I make a graph and I go, oh, okay, well that's pretty. Right? It looks like some ink blot test your psychologist gives you, right? Okay, but then I pick another set of stars and I throw down another graph and it looks completely different. I get another set of stars and I throw down another graph and it looks completely different. So I decide temperature and distance probably have nothing to do with each other which I may have guessed ahead of time because I can't think of any physics reason why that might be true. But you don't know, so you try. Okay? And so then you decide other things. So you go through all the properties. This is called a parent magnitude. This is the brightness of the star when you don't know the distance and the color. And you put them together and you throw it down and it makes a pretty picture. And you do it with another set of stars and it makes a different pretty picture. And so you decide in the end that it doesn't work. And then you go on to a new set of data. Okay? So you do this over and over and over again. Okay, so astronomers were desperate to know whether or not there were patterns in all this massive amounts of data that we were slowly learning to collect. And finally, it was figured out by these two guys. Okay, so this is Enjar Hertzsprung, he was a Danish astronomer, and Henry Norris Russell, who we previously talked about. Uh, these two were not working together. Okay, so they worked in an age where communication around the world was difficult. It took time to mail letters by steamer across the ocean or via telegraph that was finally being laid down. Okay? So they were working and they both independently discovered what I'm about to show you. And so as a consequence, we call this graph the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. But they didn't know that they had both discovered it. But today we know they both discovered it at the same time. They published within like a month of each other. Um, and so now it bears their name. This diagram that I'm about to show you is the one of the most important tools that we use in stellar astronomy. Okay? You will hear it called an HR diagram, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. You will hear it called a color magnitude diagram. But today we do them tremendously bigger than we did in the past. So if you just go, go to your latest issue of the Astrophysical Journal and you thumb through it, someone will have a paper called a 70 million star color magnitude diagram of the globular cluster M15. Right? So that's the, and we use it all the time because encoded in this diagram is the story of the history of the evolution of stars. And it's exceedingly useful if you can understand what it's trying to tell you. So today we're just going to learn the very beginning of that story. So this is what the diagram looks like. So it starts with spectral type. Okay, so this is uh, Oscar bought a fancy garbage can Monday. Okay, so which side of this is hot? Okay, the left is hot and the right is cool. Okay, so really I could put spectral type here, but if I really wanted to, I could put temperature here. And you will often see astronomers do that. Sometimes you'll see them actually write some number that they associate with color here. So this will sometimes say color. Okay, so color, spectral type, temperature, any of those things goes down here. And you can see in the background there, I actually have color on the diagram. Okay, and what Hertzsprung and Russell discovered is that on the vertical axis, the thing that you should plot is what we call intrinsic brightness or absolute brightness. It's the brightness a star has if I could line it up at the back of the room and know exactly how far away it is so that I could compare stars to other stars and be certain that I knew one was brighter than the other. Okay? And so on this diagram, we put bright stars near the top, and you put dim stars near the bottom. And if you do that, when you throw down stars, they take on very distinct patterns. The stars all fall in regular places on the diagram 
every single time you make the diagram, no matter what stars you use. Okay, and this is a schematic of what this diagram looks like. Okay, so this area here down the middle is called the main sequence. That green star there is where the sun lies. Okay, this area up here are what we call giants and supergiant stars. Okay, and this area down here are what we call white dwarfs. And when we've told this story, we've told this story a little bit before, we've talked about the stellar evolution of stars. The thing that's so awesome about this diagram is it captures the entire story of stellar evolution. Stars are born and they live their lives here on the main sequence. When they get near the ends of their lives, they crawl up here into this region of the diagram. And when they die, they fall down to this region of the diagram. So if you could watch a star over the 10 billion year history of its life, you would see it make tracks across this diagram. Now, how many of you live for 10 billion years? I mean, I know Emily will, but okay. Okay, we, none of, no human will ever see a star trace out every pathway along this diagram. So how do we figure out the story? We look at billions and billions and billions of stars, and we see them at all the different places on this diagram at different stages in their life, just like that list of people we showed you at the beginning. So let me show you this. Okay, so I have a piece of software I use called Starry Night. Does anyone use Starry Night? Okay, it's mostly geared towards amateur astronomers, but I use it all the time for everything that I do. Um, it's basically a planetarium program. You run it on your desktop, and it will show you the sky from anywhere in the world at any time at night uh, on any day of the year. Okay, but in particular, it has some interesting tools. And over here, you'll see the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And so this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. You'll see the main sequence and the giant stars and the white dwarfs are too dim to see. In fact, the white dwarfs aren't here because this is uh, set up for naked eye stars right a minute. Okay, so this is the HR diagram made from all the stars you can see in the frame over here. So this is, if we could turn out all the lights in Chicago and go out in your backyard, these are the stars you would see, and that's the HR diagram they would look. Okay? If I just move around the sky, what you'll see is that when I change the view here, the HR diagram changes. You'll notice there are stars popping up and going away all the time, but the overall structure, the diagonal main sequence, the, the uh, big uh, giant star collection, it's always there because the HR diagram is not just something we made up. It's an a, a encapsulation of the story of the lives of the stars in the picture. It applies universally to every star everywhere in the sky. Okay. Now you'll watch me hover over a star, so that's Polaris. This is where Polaris is on the HR diagram. Okay. And I'm going to pivot around. Okay, we talked about Arcturus last week, right? So Arcturus is right here, and Arcturus shows up right here in the middle of the red giants. Okay, I'm going to pivot around. I think I go to Antares next. Okay, so Antares is the heart of the scorpion, okay, right here, which we showed on that first picture of the Royal Fuyuki complex. Look at Antares, it's way up here in the red giants. Okay, and I'm going to go over to the Summer Triangle, which we can see now if you stay up late enough, but very soon it'll be prominent in the sky. Okay, so the summer triangle is the bright star Vega. Here's Vega over here on the bright end of the main sequence. Okay, it's Deneb, which is down here at the tail of Cygnus the Swan. Okay, you see Deneb way up here in the blue supergiants, as we call them. It's very bright and very white when you look at it with your eye. Okay, and then Altair, which is the eye of Aquila. And you'll see it's down in the middle of the main sequence, somewhere close to where the sun is. Every single star in the night sky lives somewhere on this diagram. Okay? Natalie. I just want to make sure I'm thinking about this in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, so we said before brightness is um, equated to size, which mm -hmm. also was equated, equated to age or where they are in their life cycle. It I can be. It okay. doesn't have to be. Okay. Right? So, so in particular, so if I look at this diagram, so we're not going to talk about the entire life age today, okay? But if a star is right here, it's very big, uh, but it's very bright, okay? And if a star is right here, it's also very big, because it, or it's very bright because it's very big, okay? But the star over here is blue, which is hot or cold, hot, and the star over here is red, which is cool. And so when stars age, a star like the sun swells up into a red giant and cools, and so it moves from here 
up to here. And as we'll see in a moment, stars are born over here with these blue big stars. Okay, so you can't just use one of the properties as a measure, you have to use both of them together. And this is how the diagram really encodes the story of stellar evolution. Stars are typically born somewhere near the main sequence. They live on the main sequence, they evolve up here to the red giants, and then they fall down here to, the, to what we call the white dwarfs. Okay, so over the course of a billion years, it will move around this diagram. So when we see it, we see it in one place. So we're seeing a snapshot of the star at a certain time in its life. Just like I take a picture of you, and this is you today. But 90 years from now, you're going to look different. You'll be in a different part of the human HR diagram, right? But 20 years ago, you looked different as well, OK? So you would move around if we had a diagram like this to describe the characteristics of people. OK, so we're only going to talk about the young part today. But, um, but the older part, where the stars evolve, is, is part of the story as well. So, OK, other questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's do some eye candy, okay? So, you know, you discover the HR diagram, you're like, oh, that's great, okay, well now I gotta find every star possible and start uh, putting these things down on the HR diagram. So, so if you go out, uh, middle of the night right now, but by midsummer, it'll be uh, when it first gets dark. Okay, so here's uh, Scorpius, the Rhoophiuchus complex falls into this region, here's Antares. Okay, uh, you can't really see it through the horizon murk in Chicago, but this is Shaula the Stinger, which is another very nice star to look at. Here's Sagittarius in the center of the Milky Way, and right above Sagittarius, there is a patch of brightness that you can see with a pair of binoculars. Or uh, if you get out dark enough, you can see it with your naked eye. And if you look at it through a telescope, it looks like this. Okay, so this is the Lagoon Nebula. And you may look at the Lagoon Nebula and go, wow, it's pretty, it's a nebula. I now know that nebulas aren't galaxies and galaxies aren't nebulas. It's gas and dust. Oh, that's cool. But you notice something interesting here. And that is this cluster of stars that appears to be embedded in the Lagoon Nebula. Okay. Now. When you see something like that, you're like, oh, that's interesting. There's some stars in the direction of the Lagoon Nebula. Now, the first time you encounter that, you're like, okay, well, that's interesting. I wonder if that's between me and the Lagoon Nebula. I wonder if it's behind the Lagoon Nebula. I wonder if I'm just seeing the superposition of the stars on the Lagoon Nebula or the Lagoon Nebula on the stars. Is it not common for those kind of clusters of stars to be inside? Well, this is exactly the point, right? The first time you see this, you're like, oh, that's interesting. But I'm going to show you a couple more examples because you see this, right? This happens. Okay? And that's exactly the kinds of thing as an astronomer you look for. You look for patterns. You're like, oh my gosh, I see clusters of stars all the time embedded in these wonderful looking but highly energized clouds of gas. So there must be a connection. And as we'll see, there is. Okay? Okay, so this is the Lagoon Nebula. So, you go looking around and you do this again. Okay, so this right here, so here's our pal Orion, right? Here's Betelgeuse and Rigel, which we just talked about. Here's the uh, belt stars, and you see they point down, as we said on that very first picture, to the bright star Sirius. But right here, between Orion and Canis Minor, uh, is a constellation called Monoceros. It's the unicorn. You can totally tell that looks like a unicorn, right? Okay, but up here, there is a very nice nebula called the Rosette Nebula. And when you look at the Rosette Nebula, you see beautiful gas and dust. But look, right here in the middle again, is a cluster of stars. So what's going on? I see all over the sky clusters of stars embedded in clouds of gas and dust. Okay, and so this starts the wheels turning. And you look around the sky and you see this happen all the time. Okay, so these complexes, the Rofuyuki complex I showed you at the beginning is another example. These are called giant molecular clouds. So these are regions of extremely dense gas in the galaxy. They're vast. They typically have hundreds to thousands of solar masses worth of material in them. And you very often see clusters of stars in regions where the gas has been cleared out. And so what does that tell me? What do you think? Almost. That's, that's exactly what you should think, right? But we would say it the, far, the, the following way. The stars are made from the gas. 
the gas is disappearing because it's all collapsing under the influence of gravity, because I know what the universal law of gravitation is, and I can work out how strong it is and how much it'll pull the gas down, and it's like, oh my gosh, I can pull enough gas down to make a star. And over and over again, I see gaseous regions, evacuated regions, and bright stars. Okay, So you'll hear us call these regions of the sky by another name. You hear us call them stellar nurseries, Okay, because these are baby stars. And so I take those stars, and I put them on an HR diagram, and I look at where they come from. Okay, And when I look at the HR diagram, where do you think all of those clusters of stars fall? Yeah, up in the upper left here. Okay, So these are very hot, very bright stars. And the story that we've pieced together is that they are being born out of all that gas and dust. So they're actually very, very young stars. Okay, And there's a whole physics story we can talk about this as well if we want to talk about nuclear fusion and everything. So there's other lines of reasoning that point us towards that conclusion. But uniformly, if I see these clusters that are emerging from all of these clouds of gas and dust in the sky, they all appear in the same place in the HR diagram. Ah, right. So, so this is this is partially has to do right. So this is an amateur astronomer. This is Brian Lula who's done this processing. This is the way you process the image to make the pictures in the nebula, the colors in the nebula, come out. Okay. So if you're an astronomer, right? So so the way astron the way amateurs take these pictures is you take a picture through a red filter, you take a picture through a blue filter, you put them into Photoshop, and then you stack them, and then you adjust them so that they have the colors you want. When an astronomer measures spectral type to put these onto the HR diagram, this here, what they do is they use precise calibrated red pictures, precise calibrated blue pictures, and they subtract the two of them, and that's how they define what the spectral type is. Okay, so astronomers have a very definitive way of doing this so that things like the color you see here don't confuse you. Right? This is your eye saying that color is red. Okay, and see, I said it was purple. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, pink, right? My daughter would be like, that's fuchsia pop, right? So, okay. So, but the point is, is, right, words that we use for color are highly subjective, right? So, when you're an astronomer, you want to use something more quantitative rather than qualitative. So, you have to have a precise numerical way of defining what that color is, okay? And we do when we put them on the diagram. Now, this, this might be getting a little off topic, but generally, I think of as stars age, they, they heat up mm -hmm. to produce new elements. Mm -hmm. but so why, why are the youngest stars also the hottest mm -hmm. stars? So, so, so there are a variety of things that affect the temperature of the stars. And far and away, the, the, the most important thing is how big the star is. And so in these young clusters in particular, you always see lots of really heavy, big, young stars. And then a smattering of lighter weight stars that are the same age, but they don't burn as hot. So, okay. I mean, we so, so in fact, if I were to put out. all of the stars in this cluster on the main sequence, they would stretch all the way down the main sequence here. Okay. okay. But those bright ones that we see there in the center of the picture are the ones up here. Okay. okay. So that's a good question. That's absolutely. You're right. Right. It's only the big ones that are super hot. Okay. Okay. And if you so so what we actually see is we see clusters in the process of formation. And so what actually happens is they all form right above the main sequence, and then they all fall down onto the main sequence. And then they spend most of their lives here on the main sequence doing their job, which, as you say, is burning hydrogen into helium. Right? Star gets up in the day, burns hydrogen into helium. Gets up the next day, burns hydrogen into helium. It's a very boring life. That's why they hate their jobs. Right? Well, what's at the bottom line of the uh, down here? Yeah, so these are so these these stars are actually very interesting to us right now. These are what are called M dwarf stars. Um, we know that there are lots and lots of them in the universe uh, because it's easier to make small cool things than it is to make big hot things, and the small cool things live much, much longer. And the reason they're of particular interest right now is when we start, we'll talk about this next week, when we look at the Kepler data in the search for exoplanets, we find lots of planets around these kinds of stars. So astronomers, this is an active area of research right now. People used to think they were uninteresting because they're dwarf stars. Come on, right? <laughs> but now it's like, oh my gosh, they have planets around them. So, so now we're, we're spending a lot more time thinking about them. So these are stars that are smaller than the sun. So they're a little bit cooler. 
Um, they, so they have that red, red color. Um, but the thing we're trying to understand now is how do they form? How do they form with planets? What are their characteristics? All of that. So that's active, active research right now. So, OK. So let's go to one last place here. OK, so right here in the middle of the Sword of Orion, the middle star in the sword is not a star at all. Right? What is it? It's a nebula. It's the Orion Nebula. Okay, so this is a astrophotograph of the Orion Nebula. If you look at this through binoculars or a small telescope, you'll see mostly this part here. So the Orion Nebula, the very first is the very first thing I ever looked at in binoculars, right? So I was I was a telescope junkie early on, and uh, one of my buddies, you know, was you know the middle of winter in Bozeman, Montana, and I was like, I'm just gonna die if I don't get to do any astronomy. And one of my buddies is like, just go get the burning binoculars out from under the couch. Okay, the couch can rock back and forth for a little while. You don't need them to prop it up. <laughs> go outside and just look at the Orion Nebula. It's like, are you? Kidding? I've seen it with my my telescope. It's fine. He's like, no. Get your binoculars out from under the couch and go look at the Orion Nebula. And I swear it blew my socks off, right? Because it is amazing how much detail you can see just with an itty bitty pair of binoculars. Okay, you don't need a telescope to do it. You can go out with your binoculars and you can see that this is clearly not a star. Okay? So it uh, always looks like a crab to me. So th this is the bright part of the nebula, and then it has these big arms that kind of reach around. Uh, even, even in a telescope, this is obviously a long-duration astrophoto, but even in a telescope, it kind of looks like this gigantic crab, like a Chesapeake crab. Uh, the back end here is another part that, in, in modern telescopes, it looks connected, so you don't realize it's a second uh, nebula, but this is often uh, called Demerens Nebula, which it has its own Messier number, because in old-fashioned telescopes, which weren't as good as the ones you have access to, um, you can't see the connection between these two regions. But uh, the center of the nebula, the brightest part, is illuminated by a small cluster of bright, hot stars emerging from the nebula. It's called the trapezium. Um, and uh, if you're a telescope amateur astronomer, telescope maker, this is always a test of your telescope is how many stars in trapezium can you see? Okay, uh, four are easy, uh, six is harder. Uh, but, uh, but these stars are, as we say, powering the nebula. They're very bright, they're very young, they're very hot, and so they're the things that are illuminating uh, this nebula. Now this nebula is part of a much larger complex that covers the entire constellation of Orion. It's called the Orion Molecular Complex, like the Rho Ophiuchi Complex. The Horsehead Nebula is part of that, the Flame Nebula is part of that, and the Orion Nebula is part of that. Now we've stared, this is a picture by an amateur, but we've stared at this for a decade or more with the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's enough data that we can map out the nebula in three dimensions. Okay, and so um, our friends at the Hayden Planetarium about five or six years ago um, took all of that data and produced a three-dimensional fly-through of the Orion Nebula, which I think is very cool, even though it's from our friends at Hayden. So I'm gonna play that for you right now so that you can see it, so. Using volume visualization, we can investigate the three-dimensional structure of the Orion Nebula. This nebula is an enormous cloud of dust and gas that is several light years across and 1,500 light years from Earth. Gas in the cloud glows from the light of four hot young stars at the heart of the nebula. Each star is thousands of times brighter than our sun. The center of the nebula is hollowed out by radiation from these central stars. We're passing a cloud called HST-10, known to astronomers from Hubble Space Telescope images. A disk of dust and debris orbits the star. Astronomers believe this marks the birth of a system of planets. Each of these teardrop-shaped clouds is a blanket of gas and dust that surrounds a newborn star.
As we pull back and end our journey, we see the nebula from the viewpoint of Earth. So the thing I like about this is that, you know, we stare at this stuff through the telescope all the time. And you kind of get in this habit where you feel like it's a painting, right? It's flat, but it's really three-dimensional. And you don't, there's just no way when you're sitting at the telescope to get the kind of sense you can get when you can actually visualize it and fly through it using computers. So, okay. So what happens? So this is the end of the story, right? So stars form in nebulas. But what happens to them when the nebula is gone, when the nebula is all used up and they emerge, as we say, from their nebular cocoons? And so this part of the sky shows also good examples of this. So right here, uh, this is uh, the constellation Taurus right over Orion. So there's a bright red star there called Aldebaran. Okay, And this cluster of stars is pretty large, kind of covers this whole area. This is called the Hyades. Okay, and then up above it, of course, is another cluster of stars that many of you are familiar with, which is called the Pleiades, or Subaru. Uh, if you look on the front of your Subaru car, you'll see the map of the Pleiades there, right? Okay, and so if we look at these, so this is a picture of the Hyades. The Hyades are a bright cluster of stars. This is Aldebaran, so it's not part of the Hyades, okay? But they're a bright cluster of stars, but you notice they look just like those bright clusters of stars that we just look like, but there's not nearly the same amount of gas and dust in this part of the sky. So the story that we've pieced together is that as they emerge from their cocoons, just like we saw in the center of the Orion Nebula there, the radiation from the stars blows what remaining gas there is out and away. And so it cleans out or clears out the cluster of stars and you're left with stars with very little gas and dust around them, okay? So, so we call these open clusters, okay? So open clusters typically have 100, maybe 1,000 stars at most. They are few enough stars that form that the gravity is not strong enough to keep all these stars together for their entire lives. Okay, so these stars will eventually disperse into the galaxy. I'll tell you that in a minute. In older books, you'll see this called, uh, sometimes see these called galactic clusters, which uh, I'll show you why uh, in a minute. But uh, we reserve that word galactic clusters now for clusters of galaxies. But in the early 1900s, we didn't know there were galaxies, and so galactic clusters meant these things. But today we call them open clusters. So if you're reading old books in the Adler Collection, you got to be careful about what you, what you read and what they call things. So this is a picture of the Pleiades, okay? And so you, often in astronomy textbooks, you'll see um, it said that the Pleiades are emerging from their cocoons as well. But in the last, oh, I would say 10 years, we've been studying this cluster and we can see the motion of these stars. We can measure the motion of the gas. And what we think is that the, the Pleiades are an open cluster that long ago emerged from their gas and dust, but they are moving through the galaxy and they just happen to be passing through some other other small random cloud of gas and dust right now. And so they're lighting up uh, these nebulae around the Pleiades right now. And the reason the gas is so blue is from the blue light of the stars. Okay. So eventually, you'll notice if you look at both the picture of the Hyades and the picture of the Pleiades, there's lots of the stars that are near the center, but they are starting to spread out. And this is the characteristic thing about open clusters. Unlike globular clusters, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, open clusters, there aren't enough stars there. There's maybe 100 or 500 stars. So there's not enough gravity to keep them bound together. And over time, they drift apart. Okay? And so this famously happens in the sky. Okay? So here's the Big Dipper. Okay, the point up here, you'll get to the North Star up here, which is just out of the picture. Okay, if I look at all the stars in the Big Dipper, what I find is that this group of them right here are all moving in roughly the same direction with roughly the same speed, but they're enormously far apart. That's why they look so big on the sky as the Big Dipper, okay? So if I color that map, all of these stars here are all moving together. So we call this a moving group or a stellar association, okay? And so we think that these are all stars that were once long ago born together out of a nebula in an open cluster, but now finally, at long last, they're drifting apart and becoming separate individual lone stars in the galaxy. So if you're looking at this in 
10,000 years, mm -hmm. these stars will be much farther. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there are cool, there are cool movies you can find that show <laughs> how, the, how the constellation will look 10,000 years from now. Um, and in fact, if you go watch one of the old episodes of Cosmos, uh, the Sagan's Cosmos, um, he runs it both directions, both forward in time and backward in time. So you can see what it looked like 10,000 years ago, which is kind of cool. So, okay. But this begs an awesome, awesome question. Where are the siblings of the sun? Just like these stars, we're all born together and they're starting to drift apart. At some point in the distant past, the stars that the sun was born with were close to us and they've now drifted away. And wouldn't it be awesome if we could look out into the galaxy and go, oh, there's a star that was born with us. There's a star that was born with us. There's a star that was born with us. Okay, and the way we do it is we look at their spectrums, right? You go look at the spectral lines you see in the sun, and because it was born with all the stars in some open cluster originally, you go find open clusters that have spectra that look just like the suns. We haven't found them yet. It's a long lost search for our orphan siblings, but they're out there somewhere. And if I had my way in our lifetime, we'd find them. So stars are always born in a group. Mm -hmm. They can't be formed just one. Well, they can be, but you typically don't see amounts of gas that are just one star. You see them in these giant clouds that have enough gas to form more than one. And so what will typically happen, the way the story goes, is a star forms, and when that star turns on, it will the, the stellar wind and the energy from the star pushes the gas around, which stimulates other stars to form. So they almost always form together. But you never see such tiny amounts of gas that just one star seems to form. And they always There's nothing that precludes it. It's just gas doesn't seem to clump in such small amounts. Okay. Yeah. And they're always in a nebula? Like that's so this is the thing, right? This, the, we, I can show you hundreds of pictures like the one that I just showed you of the Rosette and the Lagoon and the Orion where we see clusters emerging from nebulae. We do see clusters all by themselves like the Hyades or like the Pleiades where there aren't gas around them. And I can show you hundreds of those as well. But the question is where did they come from? Right. And so this is this is right. All the clues and you put it in order and you're like, oh, you start with nebulas. The nebulas form clusters. The clusters blow the nebulas away. The clusters live by themselves. The clusters drift apart. Right. So there's this kind of long chain of observational evidence that we've put together because we've seen. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories, just like the one I just told you in the sky. And just like those people I showed you at the beginning, we link it together because we can tell a coherent story that hasn't been disproven by other observations. Okay? Okay. Okay, so let's, let, let me show you this last few things and then we'll call it a day. So this is a picture of the entire galaxy spread out so that you can see the whole galaxy at once. So this is the entire night sky. It's called the galactic protection. So the disk of the galaxy, what you and I see is the Milky Way in the sky goes across the middle here. Here's the bulge of the galaxy. This is towards Sagittarius and Scorpius. Here's the large and small Magellanic clouds. So we showed uh, not this exact one, but one like this. This is where all the globular clusters are in the sky. So you remember Shapley did this. We talked about this last week or the week before. And you'll see they kind of surround the Milky Way in all directions. So this was how Shapley figured out that the center of the galaxy was there, not out here on the sun. Okay? What if I do this exact same thing for the open clusters? Where do I find them? Does anyone know? Okay, what was the original name for open clusters? Galactic clusters, because if I plot where they all are, they're right along the plane of the galaxy. So young stars, which is what we think the open clusters are, form in the disk of the galaxy, which is where all the stars in the disk of the galaxy come from. They're formed in open clusters, they drift apart, and they become the galaxy itself. So this is something that we work on here at the Adler. Some of you, you've all seen the glimpse image around the lower hall here. And uh, the Zooniverse has a project called the Milky Way Project, which uh, Grace Wolf Chase in astronomy um, is a member of the science team that does that. And the whole goal of this project is to look at all of these molecular clouds that are in the glimpse image and find places where we think stars might be forming. Okay? And so as citizens, you go in and you circle all these bubbles that you see in the uh, 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 glimpse image, 
And those are sites then that the scientists go back and they're trying to understand the formation of stars in the Milky Way. Okay? And so they had a big, uh, just two or three weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, a uh, big press release. There's a whole bunch of things that you guys, uh, you guys, citizens have found called yellow balls, okay, that we think are part of the story that we didn't really know about before, so which is kind of cool. So that's a discovery from, from this project. Okay, so as I've said, this is, this is part of the whole story. We've just talked really about this part and the initial beginning of the main sequence. The other parts of the story are that old stars live up here. Middle-aged stars live here, and dead stars live down here. And we've talked about these stars and a little bit about these stars before, but we haven't really talked about that middle-aged, mid-crisis life of the stars. And we can talk about that sometime uh, if you want to. Um, so visiting the stars, as I said, will never happen in my and your lifetime. At least I don't think so, unless one of you is working on warp drives right now and haven't told the rest of us, right? Uh, but that doesn't prevent us from figuring out what they all are about. And I always, this is the thing about astronomy that I love the most, is that there's just enough information that we can glean, and we're just clever enough that we think we can figure out the story, which is kind of awesome. I mean, every day that just, that just blows my mind away, right? So. Um, some reading for you. Uh, those of you who are amateur astronomers and like to go look at the sky, this is a fantastic book by Mike Inglis called The Observer's Guide to Stellar Evolution. It's if you want to see stars at every stage in their life, this is a guide to where to see them in the sky. So you can say, I've seen a toddler star, I've seen a teenager star, I've seen a middle-aged star. You can go through and do the whole thing. Uh, if you uh, like binocular observing, and I have uh, often encourage you all to go uh, just grab the birding binoculars off uh, from under your couch, this is a very nice book by Gary Saronic, who's uh, editor at Sky and Telescope of cool things you can see in the night sky with binoculars. And last week someone asked me if there was a good book that just kind of really generally talked um, in very broad strokes about things you could see in the sky, as well as science, as well as folklore and stories. This book is absolutely my favorite book. It's called 365 Starry Nights. It's by Chet Ramo. And so there's a little, you know, half a page to read every single night of the year. And it corresponds to something that if you go step out your back door, you can see. And sometimes it's a little bit of folklore. Sometimes it's a little bit of physics, like the physics that I've been telling you. Sometimes it's just recognizing a constellation. But it's a very, very nice book. It's very well done. Um, it's very friendly and easy to read. It's great for you. Um, it's great for uh, anyone who's, who's just getting started or even knows a lot um, about the night sky. I spend a lot of time just perusing it because uh, I enjoy it a lot. So um, I really high re highly recommend this book. If you don't have any other book, um, this is one that I always encourage people to, uh, to start with. Okay, so uh, we're out of time and that's all I'm going to say. So